before I read from the scripture this morning, um, please pray with me. Father God, we pray that you would help us to set aside the worries and concerns of the week and to come before you now with open hearts, open minds, to hear what you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from Matthew 6, uh, verses 19 through 21, and then from Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. And the verses should appear on the screen behind me. So starting in Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And now from Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. There's no anger in that, it's just not my pen. So what we're doing is taking our time with the Lord's Prayer and with the categories that Jesus covers, looking then around Matthew to attempt to fully understand him and what he's teaching us about himself and humanity being in the world. Your questions matter. Your questions about life, your questions about God, your questions about the future and the past, they flow out of past pain and past nostalgia for when things were good. They flow, your questions flow out of present unease and even the things that are going well today. Your questions about the future, a mixture of concern and excitement, and you have good questions about all those things. But what's more important than your questions with respect to the categories of God or what God chooses to tell us? Doesn't mean your questions don't matter but it's very, very, very worth attending to. What does Jesus say about these things? So our first question about heaven is, who's there? Who's not there? What's it like? When Jesus talked about heaven, he was almost exclusively talking about the reality of his followers living as citizens of heaven, to quote the, later in the New Testament. So the reason that it's important to locate God in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, is to remind us of that opportunity to live as citizens of heaven. It is comforting to know where God is, to know that he sees, to borrow from Psalm 121 to know that he doesn't rest, to borrow from Psalm, Romans 8 that he fully knows the future of our life and all of this world. When we say our Father in heaven in prayer, it is not only comforting to remember that he is our Father, it's also comforting to know that he sees the past and present and future of our loved ones. Many of you are uh, friends with Rick and Terry Johnston, and traveled to be with them at the funeral of their daughter yesterday, he asked me to say thanks. 12.15 this morning, my notifications were off. They were surrounded by the love of Christ, and that happened in a lot of ways. Some of you attended, some wrote notes, many texted and called, and they sensed that. And the reason that I bring that up is when you pray for them and you locate God 
it calls to mind and to emotion that he knows their yesterday and today and their future. People ask me questions about heaven all the time, and it would be very unkind as a pastor to answer their question with how Jesus talked about it. So instead, we do our best to imaginatively you know, consider what we do know about heaven. But what's important to tell you in a sermon is over two dozen times that Jesus talks about heaven in Matthew, he's talking about the reality of a follower of Christ receiving first the love of God and then following in this life and world. We want to know who's there. We want to know what relationships are like. We're very, perhaps, overly interested in who's not there. But what Jesus focused on is the kingdom as a reality that we receive because of his work and faith in our lives in a daily fashion. Some of you are familiar with the Bible Project. Um, I watched their video on this twice this week and found it exquisite. It's about six and a half minutes long, and the reason I'm not going to show it to you is my role is not to teach you primarily as pastor. It's to equip the saints from Ephesians. It's to encourage you, comfort you, convict you, and me with the word of the Lord. But if you want a very imaginative, clear, well-illustrated description of this in more of a teaching format, I highly recommend the Bible Project's video about heaven. It's so good. And then they talk about the kingdom of heaven as heaven is a space, a space where God's holiness fills that space, as opposed to here, where though the world is beautiful, it is marred and polluted. And there are, are beautiful things on this earth, and yet we are under the curse. We have a number of maple trees on property, um, and I used to live over there. There were four maple trees when I moved here. There are two now, and I, I tapped them this week to get the syrup, and I saw all these woodpecker holes in the bottom, and I'm a little bit worried that if the woodpeckers are going after the maples, that means they're buggy, and that means they're not going to last. I love the way maple trees look in the fall. I very much like maple syrup, as do most of the people that live in my house. And yet, those little notches on the bottom is the curse. I'm not saying woodpeckers are sinful. I'm saying that's the way the curse affects the world and mars its beauty. Where God is orients us. It orients us to the fact that there are two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of heaven and a kingdom of earth described in lots of different phrases for that in the Bible. And one of the benefits of orienting us on the kingdom of heaven is we're freed from tyranny of time. And there are a lot of ways that this uh, rears its head, and I believe when we pray and, and then expand the, the praise, our Father who is in heaven, we are reminded and encouraged that the past and the present and the future all matter. None should dominate our thought life or our anxieties. I think our own natural tendencies or to one or maybe two of those. I think parts of the world would encourage us to think about the future. Parts of the world would demand that we think about the past. And then we hear all the time, just be present, right? We hear that all the time. And that's great. Except if we have things in our past we haven't attended to, it's difficult to be present. If we have things in the future that are real, that we have to figure out between now and then, there's a challenge there. And I believe that orienting... Where God, is, that, that where God is and remembering that in prayer and in our thoughts orients us and frees us from being dominated by any of those three. I hear people tell me all the time, I just don't want to wallow in the past. And my gut, every time someone says, sorry, just got to let you know. When you tell me that, my gut is, ooh, there's something back there you're going to need to maybe unravel a little bit. And then when other people, you can tell that the only thing they talk about is the past. Well, that's not joyful. There's plenty of joy in the present. Where God is orients us, and it convicts and challenges and empowers us 
to receive first and then live as citizens of heaven. God is in heaven where it is entirely holy, where it is not marred by the ugliness of the world. And the Holy Spirit is here and through the faith of followers of Christ creates small spaces of holiness, of heavenly good. We do believe heaven exists and that it's real and beautiful. And do you know why it's beautiful? This is very, very important. It's beautiful because Jesus is there. Theological terms, that's called the beatific vision. And that is the principal reason that it is a comforting, and light-filled, and beautiful place. And while we're talking about Jesus and what the Scripture does actually teach us about heaven, there's a question about how Jesus got there and why that matters, and there's another question about what he's doing up there, and it's worth attending to. Um, this is a Presbyterian church. Our theological heritage is called Reformed in theology, which means we have a confession. Most churches have a confession, even if they're not denominational. Ours is called the Westminster Confession. And the reason that I tell you this is not because I think you think old language is super interesting. This is why. Your questions are wrapped up in and enveloped by these incredible summaries of the Scripture. The answer to this question that I'm about to give you is based on 19 different passages of Scripture. How is Christ exalted by sitting at the right hand of God? Sitting at the right hand of God exalts Christ as the God-man. He is advanced to the highest favor with God the Father with all the joy, glory, and power of this position over all things in heaven and earth. When we remember our Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit gives us a reminder that Jesus has power over all things in heaven. There Christ gathers and defends his church, subdues her enemies, provides his ministers and people with gifts and graces and intercedes for them. How does Christ intercede? We talked about this last year. This is based on 17 Bible verses. What is Jesus doing right now in heaven? Christ intercedes by continually appearing in our human nature before the Father in heaven. There he makes his will clear that his own merit of obedience and sacrifice on earth be applied to all believers. He answers all the accusations, accusations made against you, either by your flesh or the world or the evil one. Jesus answers all of them. And make sure they have peace of conscience in spite of their daily failings. I had to repent before I left church this morning. And I was not getting out the door in a timely manner. And one of the most convicting things about preaching to you people about the word of God is I need to follow it myself. Both for my own good, but also because it would be very painful to be even more hypocritical than I already am as a preacher. And I was running out of time and I had been running over the repentance in my head because it was, I was explaining instead of repenting. Nothing gets in the way of a good apology, much less a good repentance like an explanation. I finally got that out of, out of there and was able to ask my wife for forgiveness. She actually knew that I didn't intend it, which is what I was hoping for but didn't want to get into. And why am I saying that? In spite of their daily failings and he welcomes them without hesitation to the throne of grace and accept who they are and what they do for him. Heaven is important as God's space and Jesus is there now interceding for us. That ought to both comfort and convict us. Where God is, orients us to the two kingdoms, his space, holy, beautiful, and good, And you know this, right? In Genesis 1 and 2, is there a separation between the holy and the unholy? Nope. In Revelation 21 and 22, is there a separation? We actually see it go away. That's what's so beautiful about Revelation 21 and 22. If you're intimidated by that book, read it again. 
and then watch the Gospel Project video and then listen to all of my sermons on it. I'm exaggerating, but doing the work to understand that book is so comforting to the daily life of a Christian and so convicting. It has lots of virtue lists of things we're supposed to do and act like and think as Christians, lots of vice lists, things we're supposed to avoid and resist as Christians, but also a beautiful vision of the two kingdoms becoming one. I got kicked out of a Bible class my senior year for knowing Revelation 21 and 22, perhaps better than the teacher, maybe. He was just he was talking about the new heavens and new earth, and he's like, and it's so beautiful that there will be no crying in heaven. And I was like, actually, it says that Jesus will wipe away every tear. So perhaps it's even more beautiful that we connect to our sadness, but Jesus is right there. I was put into a sixth grade classroom for the rest of the year and given books to read and papers to write because I said it way, way, way more disrespectfully. Those were my words, but it was said pretty disrespectfully. But I'm not wrong. Eventually, the two spaces will become one. And this violent and polluted and idolatrous space will give way to God's holy and beautiful space. That section, Lay Up Treasures in Heaven, has three different sections the way my Bible gives it. In verse 24 that Simon did not read says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or who will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And if you have a Bible that gives footnotes, it says God and mammon. And listen, that is the only time in the Bible that Jesus uses uh, an anthropomorphic phrase to describe the potential idolatry of wealth. That's it. That's the only time. That's how dangerous that idolatry is. And there's an opportunity for us to live as citizens of heaven by resisting that idolatry. And that's how praying our Father in heaven ought to both comfort and convict us. While there are two kingdoms, one of them is in us. If, you have, if, you, if Jesus is Lord of your life, if you have received his pursuing love and responded in faith, then you are a living, moving God space in this world. And when you're not, you get to repent of it, which is perhaps the most profound, regular activity to Christians, perhaps the most obvious way that we're salt and light. Where God is orients us to the two kingdoms until there is just one. Right now they're separate, but they will come together. I'll give you a key to understanding Matthew, and I just caught this this year. I'm 45, I've been reading the Bible pretty studiously for decades. I just caught this. You read Matthew, he has the most to say about Jesus' problem with specific Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. And part of the reason that we see so many of his conflicts with them is because it happens and helps us understand the moment of uh, his earthly ministry, but also because we are supposed to become the new and better scribes. In Matthew 5, Jesus says something that troubles us but connects to the kingdom of heaven. He says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He says something very similar in chapter 13, verses 51 and 52, where he's expanding this teaching. Have you understood all these things? He says to his disciples after giving them several parables. They said to him, yes. And he said to him, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure what is old and what is new. In between the time of the kingdoms being one, Eden, and the kingdoms being one, again, the new heavens and new earth, it is our responsibility to be the new scribes, the new ones who not only know the word of God and have received it, 
but also live like it. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus says some very, very, very harsh things to the scribes and the Pharisees. But before he does that, he says to his disciples, listen to them and learn from them, but also notice that they don't live like it. And you not only know the law, be able to teach it, but also live as one who has received my love and actually believes it in day-to-day life. We are scribes in training. Those who our words reflect Jesus. Our prayers offered up boldly reflect our allegiance to him. Our study and our life in the world reflects him. If you go through Matthew and you circle every time it says kingdom of heaven, you'll come up with about two dozen. And many of them are the parables, especially at the end well, no, in the middle of the book and at the end. And at the end, the parables are about Jesus' return. The parable of the ten virgins is as the kingdom of heaven is like. And that's Jesus' way of teaching something that happens throughout the New Testament. And this is how learning the Lord's Prayer, connecting it to the rest of Matthew, is comforting, but it's also convicting. Don't wait to act like a follower of Jesus. It's what the parable of the, of the ten virgins is about. Five of them were prepared, and five were not. And being prepared means don't wait to confess and therefore repent and heal. Don't wait to ask the Lord to sanctify your anger. I'm picking two categories of the Sermon on the Mount. Your anger is not the problem always, because your anger is often how we end up doing some good and peaceable work in the world, but disproportionate anger, anger that judges people in a very unholy way. Do you ask God to sanctify that? Don't wait to avoid lust and learn to look at all the people in your life as who they are and not as objects. Don't wait, those of you that are married, to go and find your spouse. To repent to them and offer to change because love never says this is just the way I am don't wait to do what you say you will let your yes be yes and your no be no don't wait to resist retaliating that person at your work who will undermine your promotion if they get a chance what do you do be super cheerful with them no but don't undermine them. Don't wait to actually be kind to the enemies in your life. Not in a smarmy, weird way, but because Jesus said, love your enemies. When we pray, our Father who is in heaven, we're remembering where he is, and what he calls us to. And towards the end of Jesus' ministry, he told story after story that we might not wait to receive the kingdom that he purchased for us and to live like his followers. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for teaching us about life in the kingdom. We thank you for purchasing it. We resist it because we are tired. Holy Spirit, give us strength and rest. We resist it because we think we know better. (laughs) You just disabuse us of that. We resist it because we react and we were poorly mentored. Holy Spirit, re-mentor us as your followers. Jesus, we long to be so gripped by your love that we worship easily, that we love well in community, and that we go about our work as your followers. Strengthen 
us and sanctify us in and for this work. Amen.